Book 2 The Christian Theories Regarding the Form and Position of the Whole World The, proof of, the Proofs of Which Are Taken from Divine Scripture How long I put off the composition of my work regarding the figure of the earth, even though other admirable men as well as thyself frequently urged me to undertake it. You know best of all, O oh dearest, God-loving, and Christ-loving, Philanthius, a man worthy of that name, since all holy men love thee, a sojourner in the earthly Jerusalem, but enrolled among the firstborn and the prophets, with whom, when of you are, I knew thee I knew thee only by report. I was knit in the bonds of warmest friendship, and now I have had the satisfaction of having seen thee face seen having seen thee face to face when by the will of God you came hither to us to Alexander's great city and even ceased to em Importune, importune, importune us about this work. Ineffable, in F, enfeebled, though we were in body afflicted with oh. Don't know what that is, and costiveness of the bowels, and as the result, suffering afterwards from constant attacks of illness. While besides, we were deficient in the school learning of the pagans, without any knowledge of the rhetorical art, ignorant how to compose a discourse in a fluent and an embellished style and were besides occupied with the complicated affairs of everyday life. Nevertheless, you ceased not pressing us to compose a treaty about the tabernacle prepared by Moses. By Moses in the wilderness, which was a type and copy of the whole world, as I explained to thee personally by the loving voice in a cursory way, not as communicating opinions and conjectures of my own framing, but what I had learned from the divine scriptures and from the living voice of that most divine man and great teacher Patricius, who when fulfilling the vows of the Abrahamic rule, set out from Chaldea with his disciple Thomas of es Edessa, a holy man who followed him wherever he went, but by the will of God was removed from this life at Byzantium. Patric Patricius propagated the doctrines of holy religion and true science, and has now, by the grace of God, been elevated to the lofty Episcus episcopal throne of all Persia, having been appointed to the office of bishop Catholic of that county country. So then, being greatly perplexed about his undertaking, on account more especially of those who delight in censor censoriousness, whose tongues are glib and calumny, uh, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm not a very strong reader, so you can mute this and 
read it at your own speed and you can adjust the um, the volume you can also adjust the speed and you can tap double tap forward and double tap backward if you want it to scroll faster so you can read it at your own pace because this one's pretty long and I know that uh, bearing through me reading is not the easiest <laughs> but let God be praised that he's given us insight into somebody from that time on their discoveries all right let me stop especially for those who delight in sensori censoriousness whose tongues are glib and calumny and who have always who who can always find abundance of material for their scoffs and jeers i shrank i shrank with i shrank with more than ordinary has it ordinary hesitation from addressing myself to the work but you again pressed me to proceed with it press me to proceed with it loading me with condemnation upon condemnation if i refused and assuring me that and assuring me that the work would be useful for the guidance of life and for the study and understanding of divine doctrines as well as for refutation of the greek preconceptions while showing that the whole scope of divine scripture has respect to the future state as is most pointedly affirmed by the apostle when he says for we know that if we if the earthly house of this our tabernacle were dissolved we have a building of god a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens hallelujah when in these and such like terms you appealed to me and it was beyond my power to gainsay the injunctions laid upon me by your piety i consented trusting to receive the benefit of your prayers while making supplication ourselves that the divine grace without which we can do nothing aright might be vouchsafe uh, don't know to us in the opening of the of the mouth so that we might be able without polished and artistic modes of expression but in the simple words of ordinary speech while grace manifests her own peculiar powers both to teach her foster children the divine knowledge of the doctrines the lives of pious men and the figure of the world and its origin without ambiguity 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 as well as to describe all other readiness and to communicate unbegrudgingly ungrudgingly what we ourselves freely receive from god having finished therefore o god beloved the first book concerning pretend Christians, and having convicted them to the best methinks of my power, of having attempted impossibilities without our having sought to disparage the beauty of their language, which God forbid I should do, but I refute the fictitious and fab fabulous Greek theories, and having finished that book, we now in obedience to the order proceed to discuss first in this second book the christian theories regarding the figures and position of the world we shall then in the third book show that in describing and explaining the utility of figures of the world divine scripture alike in the old and the new testament is in itself sure and trustworthy in the fourth book again we shall offer a recapitulation and a delineation 
of the figures of the world, and similarly shall in the fifth book present a description of the tabernacle prepared by Moses, and exhibit the harmony of what has been said by the prophets and apostles. Be this then the book which we have entitled Christian Topography, embracing the whole world and deriving its proofs from truly divine scriptures, regarding which a Christian is not at liberty to doubt. Since then, aid from above, as has been said, cooperates with us through your prayers. We proceed to state our theories. Moses, then the divine cosmographer, says, In the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. We assume, therefore, that heaven and earth comprise the universe as containing all things within themselves, and that this is so he himself again proclaims, for in six days God made the heaven and the earth, and all that is in them is. And again in like manner, he says, and the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And again, when recapitulating and giving its name to the book, he speaks thus, this is the book of the generation of heaven and earth, as if they contained all things, and as if all things that, that are in them ought to be signified along with them. For if, according to the counterfeit Christians, the heaven alone compromises the universe, he would not have mentioned the earth along with the heaven. But he would have said, This is the book of the generations of heaven. Evidently, however, he has not done so, nor any other of the prophets. And it is manifest that they knew that the two together comprised the universe, and indeed the whole company of righteous and the prophets always indicate the heaven along with the earth. Hear what each of them says. Melchizedek, first when blessing, Abraham thus speaks, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, who created the heaven and the earth. In the second place, Abraham says, I will stretch out my hand to, the most, to God the most high, to God most high, who created the heaven and the earth. And again, place thine hand under thy thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of the heaven and the God of the earth. Hallelujah. For when the, when the most faithful Abraham wished to make his servant swear with more than usual solemnity by the circumcision, by the circumcision as being a seal royal, place he said, Thine hand under my thigh, instead of under the seal, royal, that is, the circumcision. See also Genesis 24, I'm sorry, Genesis 14, 7. Psalm, uh, I forget what C is. But uh, I'm just going to skip those. If you want to look those up, you can. Since the divine scripture of both the Old and New Testament shows by its customary declarations that all things are contained within heaven and earth, how is it possible that one can be Christian who disbelieves all this and says that all things are contained within the heaven only? Since then the heaven and the earth comprised the universe. We assert that the earth has been founded on its own stability by Creator according once more to the divine scripture, and that it does not rest upon anybody, for in the book of Job it is written, 
he hangeth the earth upon nothing. And again, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And in like manner in David, it is said, He who laid the foundations of the earth upon its own stability, by the power therefore of the deity who created the universe, we say that it was founded and is supported by him, upholding all things, as the apostle saith, by the word of his power. For if a body of any kind whatsoever were either underneath the earth or outside of it, the body could not keep its place, but would fall down according to what is seen always occurring in the natural world. For if we take air, for instance, or water or fire, we find that things such are heavier then these do invariably fall down in them, since therefore the earth is heavier than any other body what, whatever the deity placed. Any other body whatever. The deity placed it, it as the foundation of the universe and made a steadfast in virtue of its in its own inherent stability. To illustrate this, let us suppose a place to have a depth of a hundred cubits, and this place to be filled with a body denser than water, and, and, and this place to be filled with a body denser, say, than water. Then, if one should lift a stone with his hand, and drop it into the place, in what interval of time would reach the bottom? One may reply, in a few hours, in four hours, let us say, but further supposing the place to be filled with some rarer substance air, for example, in what interval of time would the stone now reach the bottom? Evidently in a shorter time, in two hours, let us say, supposing in the next place a still rarer substance than the than a rare, rarer substance, then the bottom will be reached in an hour, and with a yet rarer substance in half an hour, and again if rarer still be supposed the stone will touch the bottom in a shorter time, and so on until the body when a attenuated to the last degree becomes incorporeal, and the time ceases of necessity to be a, any time at all. Thus then, in all case, in this case supposed, where nobody at all exists, but when there is only the incorporeal, the heavy body of necessity gains the bottom in no time. At the at, at all and becomes stationary. The deity having thus in the order of nature, as the scripture declares, suspended the earth upon nothing when it had reached the bottom of space, laid its foundations upon its own stability so that it should not be moved forever, but should once again from a wanton love of contradiction assume that outside of the earth and heavens there exists a place made of another invisible and imaginary substance even such a place must of necessity rest upon something else and this again upon another and so on ad infinitum nevertheless let us with god's help tackle this subject as more a question of physical science. If one should suppose that the place to be chaos, then because, as the heaven is light and tends upwards to the earth, heavy and tends downwards, uh, page 30, page 29, okay.
tends downwards and extremes are bound together with extremes that namely which tends upward which tends upwards with which tends downwards they support the one by the other by their pulling against each other and so remain unmoved the deity accordingly having founded the earth which is oblong upon its own stability bound together the extremities of heaven with the extremities of the earth making neither extremities of the heaven rest of the heaven rest upon the four extremities of the earth while on high he formed it into a most lofty vault overspanning the length of the earth along the breadth again of the earth he built a wall from the nethermost extremities of the heaven upwards to the summit and having enclosed the place made a house as one might call it of enormous size like an oblong vaulted vapor bath for saith the prophet isaiah he who established the heavens as a vault with regard moreover to the gluing together of the heavens and the earth we find this written in job he has inclined heaven inclined heaven to earth and it has been poured out as the dust of the earth we have welded i have welded it as a square block of stone do not the expressions about inclining it to the earth and welding it thereto clearly show that the heaven standing as a vault has has its extremities bound together with the extremities of the earth the fact of its inclination to the earth the fact of its inclination to the earth and its being welded with it makes it totally inconceivable that it is a sphere moses likewise in describing the taber the table in the tabernacle which is an image of the earth ordered its length to be of two cubits and its breadth of one cubit so then in the same way as isaiah spoke so do we also speak of the figure of the first heaven made on the first day made along with the earth and comprising along with the earth the universe and say that its figure is vault like and just as it is said in job that the heaven has been welded to the earth so do we again also say the same having having learned moreover from moses that the earth has been extended in length more than in breadth we again admit admit this knowing that the scriptures which are truly divine ought to be believed but further when god has produced the waters and angels and other things simultaneously with the earth and the highest heaven itself he on the second day exposed to their vision this same this second heaven visible to our eyes which as if putting to use the creations of his own hands he formed from the waters as his material in appearance it is like the highest heaven but not in figure it is and it lies midway between that heaven and the earth and god having then stretched it out extended it throughout the whole space in the dire direction of its breadth like an intermediate roof and bound together the firmament with the highest heaven separating and dis disparting the remainder of the waters leaving some above the firmament 
and others on the earth below the firmament, as the divine Moses explains to us, and also makes the the one area or house two or house two houses an upper and a lower story but again the divine scripture speaks thus in moses concerning the second heaven and god called the firmament heaven and in the inspired david we find these words stretching out the heaven as a covering and he adds who covereth his upper chambers with the waters saying this evidently with respect to the firmament saying this evidently with respect to the firmament but scripture when coupling the two heavens together frequently speaks of them in a singular as as but one saying through isaiah he that established the heaven as a vaulted chamber and stretcheth it out as a tent to dwell in, meaning here by the vaulted chamber the highest heaven, and by what is stretched out as a tent the firmament, and thus declaring and and thus declaring them in the singular number to be bound together and to be a sim be of similar appearance david again speaks to this speaks to this effect the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork here beginning with a duality and ending with a unity for sense agreeably to the idiom of the hebrews hebrew language the same word serves to, to express both heavens and heaven and the two heavens are not only bound together as one but are also in also like in appearance but are also like in appearance and aspect the divine scripture speaks of heaven both in the plural and in the singular number indiscriminately in the sing in the singular number indiscriminately for the blessed david using this idiom exclaims praise him ye of heaven of heavens where you might say in the singular number heaven of heavens heaven of heaven for he says elsewhere for he says elsewhere and the water which is above the heavens he distinctly employing the plural number heavens and indicating that the firmament has the waters above it for following the idiom instead of saying the heaven of the heaven he said the heavens of the heavens for he again says also in other place the heaven of the heaven belongs to the lord but the earth hath he given to the sons of man here calling the highest heaven which is like a vault heaven of heaven as it is the heaven of the firmament being up being up above it much loftier and in Deuteronomy, the great Hierophant, Hierophant, Moses thus speaks, Behold, unto the Lord thy God belongeth the heaven and the heaven of heaven, the earth with all that is therein. The great apostle Paul, moreover, uses this idiom, explaining, exclaiming, For our citizenship is in the heavens, which also we look for the Savior, beginning here with the plural number and ending with the singular, for he uses from which in the singular number 
David also frequently makes the mode of expression exclaiming, Praise the Lord from the heavens. And after he said, he had said, Praise the Lord from the earth. He thus ends the praising of him in the earth in earth and heaven and in another passage to him who made the heavens in wisdom and on this subject he uses many such expressions we have said that the figure of the earth is lengthwise lengthwise from east to west and breadthwise from north to south and that it is divided into two parts this part which we the men of the present day inhabit and which is all round circled by the intermedial sea called the ocean by the pagans and that part which encircles the ocean and has its extremities bound together with those of the heaven and which men in all time inhabited to eastward before the flood in the days of Noah occurred, and in which also paradise is situated. Men, strange to say, having crossed the ocean in the ark at the time of the deluge, reached our part of the earth and settled in Persian territory where also the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, having saved alive Noah and his sons, together with their wives, so that there were four pairs, and all the brute animals three pairs of clean, but of wild only one poor pair, since Noah appears to have offered up to God in sacrifice the superfluous 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 one pair of all the clean animals there were four pairs of human beings and of clean animals three pairs and of wild beasts only one poor pair now when the ark had crossed over into the part of the earth which we now now from that time forth inhabit the three sons of noah divided the earth among them shem and his prosperity obtained the regions extending from asia as far as the eastern parts of the ocean ham and his prosperity the regions from Gar gardaria in the west to the ocean of ethiopia called barbaria beyond the Abra Arabian Gulf receiving besides the the regions extending as far as our sea that is to Palestine and Phoenicia as well as the southern parts together with all the part of Arabia which adjoins us and that which is called the happy and Japhet and his prosperity, the regions extending from Media and Cynthia in the distant north, as far as the western ocean and the parts outside of Gardiria, Gadira, according to what is written in Genesis by the inspired Moses, who is describing the division of the earth speaks thus concerning these three the sons of Japheth Gamer Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan Iovan and Elisa uh, whereby he indicates the Hyperbian nations of the Scythians and Medes, and then similar the Ionians and the Greeks, and likewise Thobel and Moshach, Moshash, Moshash, and Theres, that he may show the, what nations lay near. For he calls the 
Thracians, uh, and their and from these he tells us some were removed and dispersed among the islands of the Gentiles and adjacent localities from this in from this indicates Thar Tharsius, the inhabitations of the Cyprus of Cyprus, he called something, and those of Rhodes something, the sons of Ham, Cush, and Masraim, Masraim, thereby designating the Ethiopians and Egyptians. Finally, Phut and Canaan, whereby he designates the Libyans and adjoining nations, the sons of Cush, Saba, and El Elessia, Elessa, whereby he designates the Homerites and their neighbors, similarly also the nations one after another that occupy the southern parts, the Chaninians again, he says, were descended from Mesraim, and the Egyptians and Sidonians and all the neighboring nations, the sons of Shem, Elam, and Asher. That, all, that is the El, Elamites and Assyrians and remaining nations and as many as these as were spread far and wide over Asia and the east, the nations of the Persians, Huns, Bactrians, Indians, onwards to the ocean, the pagans even availing themselves of what Moses has thus revealed, divide the whole earth into three parts, Asia, Libya, and Europe, designating Asia the east, Libya the south, extending to the west, and Europe the north, also extending to all the west. And in, uh, and in this, our part of the earth, there are four gulfs which penetrate into it from the ocean, as the pagans also say, and say with truth when treating of this subject, namely this gulf of ours, which entering from Gadiria in the west, extends along the countries subject to Rome. The Arabian gulf, called the Erythrean, and the Persian both of which advance from Zygum to the southern and more eastern parts of the earth from the country called Barbaria, which begins where the land of the Ethiopians terminate, terminates and now Zygum, as those who navigate the Indian Sea are aware, is suited beyond the country called Barbaria, which produces frankincense and is girdled by the ocean, which streams from, th from thence into both the gulfs. The fourth gulf is that which flows from the northern, northeastern part of the earth and is called the Caspian or High here here's can't i don't know these gulfs only admit of navigation for the ocean cannot be navigated on account of the great number of its currents and the dense fogs which it sends up obscuring the rays of the sun and because of the vastness of its extent having learned these facts from the man of god as has been said, I have pointed them out as coincident also on my own experience, for I myself have made voyages for commercial purposes in three of these gulfs, the Roman, the Arabian, and the Persian, 
while from the natives or from seafaring men I have obtained accurate information regarding the different places. Once on a time when we sailed in the gulfs bound further for further India, we had almost crossed over to Barbaria, which beyond Barbaria, beyond which there is situated Zingium, and as they term the as they term the mouth of the ocean, I saw there to the right of our course a great flight of birds, which they call Sufa, Sosfa, which are like kites, but somewhat more than twice their size. The weather what was there so very unsettled that we were all in alarm for all the men of experience on board, whether passengers or sailors, all began to say that we were near the ocean and called out to the pilot, steer the ship to port and make for the gulf, or we shall be swept along by the currents and be carried into the ocean and be lost. For the ocean rushing into the gulf was swelling into billows of portentous size while the currents from the gulf were driving the ship into the ocean and the outlook was altogether so dismal that we were kept in that we were kept in a state of great alarm a great flock excuse me a great flock all the time of the birds called Sulfsa followed us flying generally high over our heads and the presence of these was a sign that we were near the ocean. The northern and western parts of the earth which we inhabit are the very great elevation sorry the northern and western parts of the earth which we inhabit are of very great elevation while the southern parts are proportionately depressed for to what extent of its breadth the earth is imperceptibly depressed it is found to have an elevation of, li of like area in the northern and western parts, while the ocean beyond is of unusual depth. But in the southern and eastern parts, the ocean beyond is not of usual, but of, med of the medium depth. When these facts are considered, one can see why those who sail to the north and the west are called lingers. It is because they are mounting up in, in a mounting up they sail more slowly while in returning they descend from high places to low and thus sail fast and in a few days bring their voyage to an end. Then the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, flowing down from the northern parts, that is from Persarmenia to the south, have far more rapid currents than our river the Nile, that is, the Goan. For this river Nile, flowing from low lying regions in the south toward the elevated northern regions and running as one may may say up pursues quietly even pursues quietly the even tenor of its way 
the eastern and southern parts again as low-lying and overheated by the sun are extremely hot while the northern and western from their great elevation and distance from the sun are extremely cold and in consequence the inhabitants have very pale complexions and must keep themselves warm against the cold but the whole of this portion of the earth is not inhabited for the parts in the extreme north are to the last degree cold and remain uninhabited just as the parts in the extreme south remain also inhabited on account of the excessive heat for the blessed for the blessed david thus spoke thus speaks neither from the going forth neither from the goings forth nor from the goings down of the sun nor from the desert mountains where he calls the east exodus where he calls nor from the desert mountains interesting where he calls the east exodus and the west dasmas dusmas and the other region namely the extreme north and extreme south desert mountains the pagans when writing on these subjects say that say what is true concerning them these things being so we shall say agreeably to what we find in the divine scripture that the sun issuing from the east traverses the sky in the south and ascends northwards and becomes visible to the whole of the inhabited world but as the northern and western summit inter intervenes it produces night on the ocean beyond this earth of ours and also in the earth beyond the ocean and afterwards when the sun is in the west where he is hidden by the highest portion of the earth and runs his course over the ocean through the northern parts through the northern parts his presence there makes it night for us until in describing his orbit he comes again to the east and again ascending the south the southern sky and this is this sounds incredible I'm not really understanding what he's talking about but it sounds incredible for researching biblical cosmology and again ascending the southern sky illumines and inhabit the inhabited world as the divine scripture says through the divine Solomon the sun rises and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his own place rising there he goeth to the south and wheeleth his circuit and the wind turneth round to his circuits and the wind turneth round to his circuits here he calls the air the wind for as he says the sun making a circuit in the air from east to south from south to west from west to north from north to east causes the vicissitudes of the day and night and the solstice is for by the expressions wheeleth his circuit and turneth round to his circuits he signified not only the revolution but also the solstices for which is the plural number he uses for for he does he uses for he does not say that the wind describes a circuit but that the sun does it does so through the wind that is through the air yea even the blessed moses having been ordered on mount sinai to make the tabernacle according to the pattern which he had seen said under divine inspiration 
that the outer tabernacle was a pattern of this visible world. Now, the divine apostle in the epistle to the Hebrews is explaining the inner tabernacle, or that which was within the veil, declare, declares that it was a pattern of the heavenly, that is, of the kingdom of the heavens, or the future state, taking the veil which divides the one tabernacle into two for the firmament. Just as the firmament placed in the middle between the heaven and the earth has also made has made two has made two worlds this world namely and which is, and that which is to come into which world to come the first who entered was the forerunner on our behalf Christ who thus prepared for us new a new and living way now in his description of the first tabernacle Moses places in the south of it the candlestick with seven lamps after the number of days in the week these lamps being typical of the celestial luminaries and shining on the table placed in the north of the earth on this table again he ordered to be daily placed twelve loaves of showbread according to the number of the twelve months of the year three loaves at each corner of the table to typically to typify the three months between each of the four tropics he commanded also to be weather weather wreathed all around the rim of the table a weaved molding to re represent a multitude of waters that is the ocean and further in the circuit of the waved work weaved work a crown to be set at the circumference of the palm of the hand and to represent the land beyond the ocean and encircling it where in the east lies paradise and where also the extremities of the heaven are bound to the extremities of the earth and from and from this description we not only learn concerning the luminaries and the stars that most of them when they rise run their course through the south but from the same source we are taught that the earth is surrounded by the ocean and further that beyond the ocean there is another earth by which the ocean is surrounded but again from the prophecy of Lamech the father of Noah we learn that Noah by means of the world carrying ark was to convey men and the brute beasts into this earth earth of ours for the prophecy runs somewhat to this effect this same shall give us rest concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord God hath cursed for this reason also Lamech gave Noah his name which means rest for f for the first man having sinned and having been cast by God out of the garden into the earth which was foul with thorns and of effet 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 those ten generations smarted under grievous chastisement being forbidden according to the sacred scripture to eat any longer of fruit that grew upon a tree because man had transgressed by eating the fruit of the tree and meager and meager truly was the fair on which the generations from Adam to Noah subsided.
subsisted. Since they, since they neither ate the olive nor tasted either wine or flesh, but were commanded to eat only grain, and that to although, and that to although there, the earth was by no means productive, but required the very hardest toil for its cultivation. And thus saith the scripture, Cursed is the ground in thy labors, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat thy bread. With regard to wine, it is manifest from what is recorded in Scripture that after the deluge, Noah, having planted the and cultivated the vine and expressed the juice from the grapes, drank to excess of the sweet must of which he had no previous experience and made himself drunk. And with regard to flesh, the case is still more manifest, for God instructed him in these terms, Lo, I have given you all things as the green herb to eat, but flesh in the blood thereof shall ye not eat. Meaning this, lately I interceded interdistic interdict anyways you from eating many things but now i permit you to eat of all things and to eat even flesh sacrifice therefore and pour out the blood and then eat the flesh as ye eat vegetables and eat also of the olive of which there of which before the flood it was not permitted to eat because it also was the fruit of a tree but perhaps someone will object and say if it is true that before the flood they did not eat flesh why is it then written abel was a keeper of sheep and brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. If they did not eat flesh, why did they take upon them the care of sheep? And why did not Abel, when he brought a lamb for sacrifice, not slay it? Now, one who, set, who so inquires will be truly answered that in making the oblation, he presented the holoca holocausts alive. For one of the additions shows this, saying, Over Cain and over his sacrifice we did not apply fire, so that it is evident that the offerings uh, were consumed with divine fire. They provided themselves with a flock to produce for themselves milk and wool. Another objection, if they did not eat flesh, how came, how came it into their head to select the fat for the sacrifice of God? Answer, because when anything is to be burned in the fire, fat is more readily set ablaze. Text When God in his mercy wished that the human race should no longer should be no longer pinched with such sancti sancti fair and such hard toil, as they were less robust than the first men who being newly created were better able to sustain their punishment. God taking occasion from the wickedness of men, of whom he found 
none righteous except Noah, brought in a flood for two or even for for two or even for more reasons, that he might destroy the wicked and save alive him that was righteous for the instruction of future generations, that by the untimely end of the wicked he might the better the better deter he might the better deter those who are liable to death and will some time or another or other die from doing what is wicked and that he might bring men to the brutes that were created for the use of man un into this earth into this earth of ours which is better than the other and almost equal to paradise which also he hath done he hath done having ordered noah who was left in this earth after the flood to taste of everything whether tree or grain and having taught him also to eat flesh but that he brought in the flood not for the purpose merely of destroying the wicked is evident from the fact that the water prevailed for a length of time although one or two days were quite sufficient to have destroyed them all but he brought he brought it in also that he might take the ark across the ocean and bring it to this earth of ours. For during 150 days did the water prevail without diminishing, without one until, wonderful to relate, the ark came to this earth of ours. The circumstance, cir the circumstance moreover, that the water rose 15 cubits above the top of the highest mountains makes it evident beyond all question that this was due to the depth to which the ark was submerged in the waters in order that it might rest upon the mountains for a half of the height of the ark was under water to the depth of 15 cubits for its entire height was 30 cubits from this then as well as from the prophecy of Lamech and the construction of the table and the tabernacle, we can learn that beyond the ocean there is an earth which encompasses the ocean. Nay, more, the Hierophant, Moses, also in Deuteronomy, say, saith thus, And thou, Israel, hear and command which I give unto thee this day, do not say in thine heart who shall go up into heaven to bring it down to us, or who shall go over the sea for us to bring it to us. But the word is nigh unto thee even in my mouth. By this he means, say not it is poss impossible to go up into heaven to bring down thence the divine precepts, or to come over, or to cross over to the further side of the sea to bring them. Sorry, got something in my eye. Cross over to the farther side of the sea to bring them thence. For lo, they are in thy mouth and in thy heart and in. In the same passage, he teaches us two truths, that beyond the ocean there is land, or a place, and that it is impossible to cross the ocean. Just as we, while in this mortal state, cannot possibly go up into heaven, even Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah, the prophet, when giving counsels and of pr pr prudence in this epistle being a man well taught in the instruction institutions of Moses speaks in the same strain with Moses and says who hath gone up 
into heaven, and taketh, and taken it, and brought it down from the clouds, who hath passed over the sea. Here he does not speak of our sea, for it admits of being crossed, but of the ocean itself. Yet if paradise did exist in, the, in this earth of ours, many a man among those who are keen to know and inquire into all kinds of subjects would think he could not be able to quick would think he could not be too quick in getting there for if there be some who to procure silk for the miserable grains gains of commerce hesitate not to travel to the uttermost ends of the earth how should they hesitate to go where they would gain a sight of paradise itself now this country of silk is situated in the remotest of all the indies and lies to the left of those who enter the indian sea far beyond the persian gulf and the island called by the indians Selbide, and by the Greeks Tartrapobane is called Tzitza and is surrounded by the left of left by the ocean just as Barbaria is surrounded by it on the right. The Indian philosophers called the Brachmans say that if you stretch a cord from Tsitsa Tsitsa to pass through Persia onward to the Roman dominions of the earth of the of the middle of the earth would be quite correctly traced and and they are perhaps right for the country in question deflects considerably to the left so that the loads of silk passing by land through one nation after another reach Persia in a comparatively short time, whilst en route by sea to Persia is vastly greater, for just as great a distance of the Persian Gulf runs up into Persia, so great a distance, and even a greater one, to turn who being bound for Tsinsa sails eastward from Trapobane, while besides the distances from the mouth of the Persian Gulf to Trapobane and the parts beyond through the whole width of the Indian Sea are very considerable. He then who comes by land from Tsitsa to Persia shortens very considerably the length of the journey. And this is why there is always to be found a great quantity of silk in Persia beyond Tsitsa. There is neither navigation nor any land to inhabit. If one measures in a straight cord line the stages which make up the length of the earth from Tsitsa to the west, he will find that there are somewhere about 400 stages, each 30 miles in length. The measurement is to be made in, in this way, from Tsitsa to the borders of Persia, between which are included all Iowa, India, and the country of the Baractians. There are about 150 stages at least, and the whole country of the Persians has 80 stations, and from Nisibis to Secluria, there are 13 stages, and from Selu Seleucia to Rome, and, and the Gauls, the Arab Eberia, who in, whose inhabitants are now called spin, spin, uh, Spaniards, Spaniards, onward to Gadiria, 
Gardiera. Gardiera. I don't know. Which lies which lies out out towards the ocean. There are more than 150 stages, thus making altogether the number of stages to be 400, more or less. With regard to breadth from the Hyperbian regions to Byzantium, there are not more than 50 stages, for we can from conjecture as to the extent of uninhabited and inhabited parts of those northern regions from the Caspian Sea, which is a gulf of the ocean from Byzantium again to Alexandria, there are 50 stages, and from Alexandria to Cataractx, Katar 30 stages, and from Cataracts to Axioms, 30 stages, and from Axioms to the projecting part of Ethiopia, which is the frankincense country called Barbaria lying along the ocean and not near but at a great distance from the land of Sasu, which is the remotest part of Ethiopia, 50 stages, more or less, so that we may reckon the whole number of stages at 200 more or less. And thus we see that even here the divine scripture speaks the truth in representing the length of the earth to be double its breadth. For thou shalt make the table in length two cubits and the breadth one cubit. A pattern as if were of the earth. The region which produces frankincense is situated at the projecting part of Ethiopia and lies inland but is washed by the ocean on the other side. Hence the inhabitants of Barbaria being near at hand go up into the interior and engaging in traffic with the natives bring back from them many kinds of spices, frankincense, cassia, calamus, and other articles of merchandise, which they afterwards send by sea to Adule, to the country of the Homerites, to further India and to Persia. This very fact you will find mentioned in the book of Kings, where it is recorded that the queen of Sheba, that is, of the Homerite country, whom afterwards the Lord in the Gospels calls the Queen of the South, brought to Solomon spices of this very barbaria which lay near Sheba, on the other side of the earth, uh, on the other side of the sea, together with bars of ebony and apes and gold from Ethiopia, which though separated from Sheba by the Arabian Gulf, lay in its vicinity. We can see again from the words of the Lord that he calls these places and he calls these places the ends of the earth, saying, The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the generation of, and shall condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Matthew 12.42 For the Homerites are not far distant from Barbaria, as the sea which lies between them can be crossed in a couple of days. And then, beyond Barbaria, is the ocean, which is called, which there is called Zingian. The, the country known as as that of Sasu is itself near the ocean. But as the ocean is near the frankincense country, in which there are many gold miners, 
the king of the Axiomites accordingly every other year through the governor of Agu sends thither special agents to bargain for the gold and these are accompanied by many other traders upwards says of the five hundred bound on the same errand as themselves they take along with them to the mining dis district oxen lumps of salt and iron and when they reach its neighborhood they make a halt at a certain spot and from an encampment which they fence round with a great hedge of thorns within this they live and having slaughtered the oxen cut them in pieces and lay the pieces on top of the thorns along with a lump of salt and the iron and and the iron then come the natives bringing gold in nuggets like peas called chancharas and lay one or two or more of these upon what upon what pleases them the pieces of flesh or the salt on or the iron and then they retire to this to some distance off then the owner of the great meat of the meat approaches and if he is satisfied he takes the gold away and upon seeing this this its owner comes and takes the flesh or the salt or the iron if however he is not satisfied he leaves the gold when the native when the native seeing that he has not taken it comes and either puts down more gold or takes up what he had laid down and goes away such is the mode in which business is transacted with people of that country because their language is different and interpreters are highly are hardly to be found the time they stay in that country is five days more or less according as the natives more or less readily come forward to buy all their wares on the journey homeward they all agree to travel well armed since some of the tribes through those country they must pass might threaten to attack them from a desire to rob them of their gold the space of six months is taken up and this trading expedition including both the going and the returning in going they march very slowly chiefly because of the cattle but in returning they quicken their pace lest on the way they should be overtaken by winter and its and its rains for the sources of the not river nile lie somewhere in these parts and in winter on account of the heavy rains the numerous rivers which they generate obstruct the path of the traveler the people there have their winter at the time we have our summer it begins in the month epiphy and the egyptians and and of the egyptians and continues till thoth and during the three months the rain falls in torrents and makes a multitude of rivers all of which flow into the nile the facts which i have just recorded fell partly under my own observations observation and partly were told by told me by traders who had been to those parts and now i wish to give an account to your piety for a matter quite pertinent to our subject on the coast of ethiopia two miles off from the shore is a town called adule which forms the port of the axiomites and is much frequented by traders who come from alexandria and the atlantic gulf 
here is to be seen a marble chair just as you enter the town on the western side of the road which leads to Aximus. This this chair appertained uh, uh, to one of the Ptolemies who had subjected this country to this his to his authority. It is made of costly white marble, which as we employ for marbles tables, but not of the sort which comes from Procinus. Its base is quadrangular, and it rests at the four corners on four slender, elegant pillars, with, with one in the middle of greater girth and grooved in spiral form. The pillars support the seat of the chair as well as its back as its back back against which one leans and there are also sides to right and left the whole chair <clears throat> with its base five pillars seat and back and sides to the right and left and sides to to right and left has been sculpt sculptured from a single block into this form it measures about two cubits and a half and is in shape like the chair we call the bishop's throne behind the chair is another marble of basanite stone three cubits in height and of quadrangular form like a tablet which at the center of its upper portion rises to a sharp point whence the sides slope greatly down in the form of a letter lambda but the main body of the slab is rectangular this tablet has now fallen down behind the chair and the lower part has been broken and destroyed. Both the marble and the chair itself are covered with Greek characters. Now when I was in this part of the country some five and twenty years ago or less, at the beginning of the reign of the Roman Empire, Justinian, Justinus, L.S. by, excuse me, who was the king of the Axiomites and was preparing to start on an expedition against the Homerites on the opposite side of the Gulf, wrote to the governor of Adule, directing him to take copies of the inscriptions on the chair of Ptolemy and on the tablet and send them to him. Then the governor, whose name was Abbas, applied to myself and another merchant called Mes, 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 Mesnas, who afterwards became a monk of Ridathu, and not long ago departed this life, and at his request we went and copied the inscriptions one set of the copies was made over the governor but we kept also like copies for ourselves which i which i shall here embody in this work since their contents contribute to our knowledge of the country its inhabitants and the distances of the several places we found also sculptured on the back of the chair figures of Hercules and Mercury. And my companion, Manas, of happy memory, alluding to the war, these would have, have it that Hercules was the symbol of strength and Mercury of wealth. I remembered, however, the Acts of the Apostles 
and would on this point differ from him upholding that we should take Hermes rather than rather as the symbol of speech for it is recorded in the Acts that they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury because he was the chief speaker here is the form of the chair and of the marble and Ptolemy himself Ptolemy himself inscription on the tablet the great king Ptolemy son of King Ptolemy and Queen Arsinoe twin gods grandson of two of the two sovereigns King Ptolemy and Queen Bernice gods Sortes sprung from Hercules the son of Jupiter on the father's side and on the mother's side from De Dionysius the son of Jupiter having having received from his father the kingdom of Egypt and Libya and Syria and Phoenicia and Cyprus and Lucia and Caria and the islands of the Caliades made an expedition into Asia with forces of infantry and cavalry and a fleet of elephants from the Trogdolites and Ethiopia animals which his father and himself were the first to capture by hunting in these countries and which they took down to Egypt where they had themselves trained for employment in war and when he had made himself master of all the country on this side of the Euphrates and of Cilicia and Pamphylia and Innoia and the Hellas point and Thars and of all the forces in the provinces and of the Indian elephants and had also made subject to his authority all the monarchs who ruined who ruled in these parts he crossed the Euphrates River and when he had subdued Mesopotamia and Babylonia and Susanna and Persis and Media and all the rest of the country as far as Bactrania, Bactrana and had collected all the spoils from the temples which had been taken away from Egypt by the Persians he conveyed to them that the country along with the other treasures and sent back his troops by canals 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 oh my goodness which had been dug <laughs> Such was the inscription on the t tablet so far as we could copy it out. And, but for a few words, it would have been the whole, for it was only a small part of the tablet that had been fractured. The inscription again on the chair was a continuation of the other and ran thus. Having after this a strong hand compelled the nations bordering on my kingdom to live in peace, I made war upon the following nations and by force of arms reduced them to subjugation. Subjection. I, war, I warred first with the nation of Gaz and then with Ag Agne and Sige, and having conquered them, I exacted the half of all they possessed. I next reduced Aua and Taimo, called Tiza and Baugambela, and the tribes near them, he means the nations beyond the Nile, 
and Zigbean and Agbe and this place and that place and the blank place. A people who lived beyond the Nile on the mountains, difficult of access and covered with snow. Where the year is all winter with hailstorms, frosts, and snows, into which a man sinks knee deep. I passed the river to attack these nations and reduced them. I, eat, I next subdued Lazin and Zay and Gal tribes, which inhabit mountains with steep D. Clevites abounding with hot springs, the Atalmo and Bega, and all the tribes in the same quarter along with them, I proceeded next against the Tag Tagnate who adjoined the borders of Egypt, and having reduced them, I made a footpath giving access by land into Egypt from that part of my dominions. Next, I reduced any and Mitten tribes inhabiting pre pre precipitous mountains. My arms were next directed against the Secede nation. These had retired to a high mountain difficult of access, but I blockaded the mountain on every side and compelled them to come down and surrender. I then selected for myself the best of their young men and their women, with their sons and daughters, and all besides that they possessed, the tribes of Rashuishi, I next brought to submission. A barbarous race spread over wide waterless plains in the interior of the frankincense country. Advancing thence towards the sea, I encountered the Sulate, whom I subdued and left with instructions to guard the coast. All these nations protected, though they were by mountains, all but imper impregnable, I conquered after engagements in which I myself was present. Upon their submission, I restored their territories to them subject to the payment of tribute many other tribes besides these submitted of their own accord and became likewise tributary and i sent a fleet and land forces against the arabite and xenopolite who dwelt on the other side of the red sea and having reduced the sovereigns of both I imposed on them a land tribute and charged them to make traveling safe both by sea and by land. I thus subdued the whole coast from Louis-Combe to the country of Sabians, a first and I first and alone of these kings, of the kings of my race, made these conquests. For this success, I now offer my thanks to my mighty God, Ares, who begat me, and by those who aid I reduced all the nations bordering on my own country, on the east to the country frankincense, and on the west to Ethiopia and Sasu. Of these expeditions, some were conducted by myself in person and ended in victory, and the others I entrusted to my officers. Having thus brought all the world under my authority to peace, I came down to Aduli and offered sacrifice to Zeus and to Ares and to Poseidon, whom I entered to befriend all who go down to the sea in ships. Here also I re reunited all of my forces, and setting down this chair in this place, I consecrated it to Ares in the 27th year of my reign. 
Socially of Cosmos of the inscription of Ptolemy from the Vatican Codex. Then Lesian and Zay and Gaba, these nations are called by these names up to the present time. I conquered the sea nation, sea nation here. He indicates the nations of Barbaria. The Avaruku, no, he refers to the people of a Hermite country, that is, the inhabitants of the Arabia Felix. From Lucia Camaga, no, in the territories of the Belamis, there is a village called uh, as far as the country of the Sub Sabians. Note the land of the Sabians is also in the Homerite country and in the places of Sasu. Note the land of Sasu where there is much gold, that which is known as Tanchura Charas. As the remotest in Ethiopia, but beyond this, and also beyond the country of the Barbariotes, the people who trade in frankincense lies the ocean. Such is the inscription on the chair, and this is very, and at this very day, in the very place where that chair stands they execute in front of the condemned criminals. But whether this custom is, has prevailed from the time of Ptolemy, I cannot say. I have set all this down from a desire to show that he is quite correct in taking the land of Sasu to Barbaria to, to lie at the extremity of Ethiopia, since he had subjected, subjugated, excuse me, I apologize, since he had subject, subject, subjugated all these regions and the tribes by which they were inhabited, most of which we ourselves have seen, while about the rest uh, we obtained accurate information when we were in their neighborhood, for most of the slaves were, which are now found in the hands of merchants who resort to these parts, are taken from the tribes of which we speak as for Semenia, where he says that says there are snows and ice. It is that the country of the king of Axiomites expand expand trees any one whom he has sentenced to be banished, the nation again, which has its seats beyond the Arabite and the Synedocopliate. And the country of the Sabians he called the, I don't know if that actually affects how it looks on for you guys. He calls the Homerites. We can accordingly, from what has been recorded correctly, estimate that estimate the breadth of the earth from the Hyperbian regions down to Sasu and Barbaria, the frankincense country, to be not more than 200 stages of 30 miles each. I have written thus with the advantage of expressing e exact knowledge, and I cannot therefore have fallen much short of the truth for the facts I am uh, indebted partly to what I observe in the course of my voyages and travels, and partly to what I learned from others on whose accuracy I could depend. Thus, even in the matter, uh, in this matter, divine scripture is proved to be right. 
and the pagans to be wrong, who in preference the truth and in support of their vanity advance conjectures, sophistries, and old wise fables, no matter how false inventing forsooth another zone farther, farther south than the torrid and like the earth which are which we inhabit and although no one has either seen or heard of such for how could that be seen or heard of that of heard of that has never come within the care of our senses Hence the nonsense they babble cannot be accepted, for it is in the jargon of mere novices, quibbling and not on old adepts in the art, these youngsters supposed that by their plausible sophisms they could refute the opinions of those who were born them, thus attempting the impossible as we have provided in brief in the in brief in the preceding book note on ptolemy this ptolemy is one of those ptolemies who reigned after alexander the concerning whom the prophet daniel prophesied in different passages and especially in the dream of nebuchadnezzar and in the vision of the four beasts that rose up from the sea, which Daniel himself saw, namely in the image a head of gold, but in the vision a lioness, by which he signified the kingdom of the Babylonians, that that is Nebuchadnezzar, then in the image of the beasts, in the image the breast and the arms of silver, but in the vision a bear, namely the empire of the Medes, which was inferior to that of the Babylonians, whereby he means Darius the Mede, next again in the image, the belly, and the thighs of brass, but in the vision a leopard, the kingdom, namely of the Persians, by which he signifies Cyrus, who, whose... <laughs> empire was no less splendid and renowned than that of the Babylonians. Then again, in the image, the legs of iron, and in the vision of a, a beast terrible and dreadful with claws of brass and teeth of iron, by which he indicates the Macedonian empire, that is Alexander breaking kingdoms in pieces and subduing them. Then again, in the image of the feet and toes, partly of iron and partly of clay, and in the vision, ten horns, corresponding in number with the toes by which he means the empire of Alexander broke up after his death, which in the vision vision also of the ram and the he goat was he was he says broken up towards the four winds of heaven for when alexander was approaching this when it was approaching his end he divided his empire among his four friends of whom one reigned in Europa, and that is Greece, another in Asia, another in Syria, the Bab the and Babylonia, and the fourth in Egypt, Libya, and the southern parts. Unto these four were many sons born who filled their thrones after them and brought manifold evils upon the world, as has been recorded in the book of the Maccabees. Now the little horn, speaking great things that was in the midst of the ten horns, signifies Antichus, 
Ephesus, who warned against the Jews in the days of the Maccabees. He speaks, therefore, of all these things as partly of iron and partly of clay, to show them as conquering each other and, uh, and being conquered in truth and not mixed together, just as iron and clay do not commingle. Then again, in the image, he speaks of the stone cut out of the mountains without hands, and in the vision of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, whereby he indicates the Lord Christ by both sides of his descent from Abraham and from the virgin without human seed, for, there, for here the words without hands means without human seed, while the words on the clouds of heaven are employed because the clouds without human hands carry as it were in their womb and the rains to which they give birth. Then again in the image, the words, and he smote the clay, the iron, the brass, the silver, and the gold. And the gold became like the chaff of the summer, threshing floors, and the wind with its gusts swept them away, and they and there was no more place found for them. Daniel two thirty five. And in the vision of the words I beheld till the beast was slain in his body destroyed, and given to be buried with fire, or given to be burned with fire, and as for the rest of the beasts their domini their dominion was taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season. Daniel 7, 2 Signify respectively the same thing, namely, that at the coming of the Lord Christ all these empires would be taken away and taken away. The Babylonian, the Median, and the Persian, and the Macedonian while all the kingdoms that arose from the partition of the last would become of no account, and such as the, as the very condition of things in the time of Christ, for neither did Babylonian, Median, Persian, nor Macedonian empires then exist, but they had all been destroyed. Then again, in the image, he says, In all the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the sovereignty there, thereof be left to another people, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2, 44. And in the vision, he says, and he came even to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion in, uh, is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7. 1 through 1, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. This one instance, more of his saying, the same thing both in the image and the vision, namely that the coming of the Lord Christ, those kingdoms shall pass away and be destroyed, but his kingdom shall be indissoluble and eternal. This Ptolemy is therefore one of those who reigned either Thaltomir or Eugrits, the second or the king called Dionysius, who preceded the last Cleopatra. For these reigned more than seven and twenty years and were descended from the first Ptolemies, 
who were the sovereigns of Egypt in accordance with the inscription on the marble tablet of which we have given a copy. For concerning the kings that now we are, nothing has been written in the prophet Daniel, as the Lord himself says that the law and the prophets prophesied until John, from when Nebuchadnezzar was cog, cog, I don't know that word, whether his kingdom would endure, and Daniel, whether the Judic rites would be perpetually observed, the same revelation was made to both alike. At, at one and at the same time shall the kingdom come to an end, and the Judaic ritual and ritual observances be abolished, and new and better dispensation shall supersede the old, and, and be eternal and indissoluble. And this shall have its beginning, when the first kingdoms and legal rights shall cease, and be openly exhibited when its supreme head makes his appearance. For concerning the Roman Empire, nothing is expressly written in the prophet. For it did not, for it did not rise by succession from Nebuchadnezzar, nor has it congruity with the pol polity of the Jews or to speak more correctly with the laws which they obey, but is rather calculated to destroy them. Nor did, the succeed, nor did it succeed the empire of the Macedonians. For he says, The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Here he speaks of the Lord Christ, and within the scope of his words includes, though but darkly, the Roman Empire, which made its appearance contemporaneously with the Lord Christ. For while Christ was yet in the womb of the Roman Empire, received its power from God as the servant of the dispensation which Christ introduced since at the very, at the very time the ascension was proclaimed of the unyield, unending line of the Augusti, by whose command a census was made which embraced the whole world. The evangelist certainly indicated, indicates that the enrollment was first made in the days of Augustus Caesar, when the Lord Christ was born and the Deemed, deemed to be enrolled in a country subject to dominion and to pay tribute thereto. The Empire of the Romans thus participates at thus participates in the dignity of the kingdom of the Lord Christ, seeing that it transcends as far as can be in the state of existence. Every other power and will every other power and will remain unconquered until the final consummation, for he says that it shall not be destroyed forever. Now if the now, if that expression forever be taken as applying to the Lord Christ, it signifies endless duration in accordance with what Gabriel says to the Virgin. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. If again the expression be taken as applying to the Roman Empire, which 
made its appearance in the world along with Christ. This shall not be destroyed while this world continues. For I assert with confidence that though by way of chastisement for our sins, hostile barbarians rise up for a short while against the Roman dominion, yet that by the valor of him who governs us, the empire will continue to be invincible, provided it does not restrict but widens the influence of Christianity. I say, so because this imperial family believed in Christ before the others, and this empire is the servant of the dispensation established by Christ, on which account he who is the Lord of all, preserves it in preserves it unconquered till the final consummation. The royal family of the Persians, on the other hand, is not of Persian lineage, nor in the line of the succession of its former kings, but it sprang from an alien power that is from Magi, for by the time Christ, the empire of the Persians had been destroyed by Alexander in accordance with the prophecy, and the successors to his empire ruled that part of the world until the time of Antiochus, after which the Parthians gradually made themselves masters of the country. In point of fact, they marched in arms against Jerusalem, and took prisoner Hyrcanus, the ruler of the Jews, not only before the advent of the Lord Christ as, regarded, as regards this empire of the Magi, it is now about 400 years since it was founded, and in many in my opinion, it ranks next to that of the Romans because the Magi, in virtue of their having come to offer homage and adoration to the Lord Christ, obtained a certain distinction. For it is in Roman dominions that the preaching of Christianity first became current in the days of the apostles, and it, it was immediately afterward extended to Persia, by the Apostle Thaddeus, and to be sure we find this written in the Catholic epistles, the church that is in Babylon, elect together with you, saluteth you, the Roman Empire. Moreover, has many bulwarks of its safety in that it is the foremost power in the world in that it was the first to believe in Christ, and in that it renders service to every department of the Christian economy. There is yet another sign of the power which God has accorded to the Romans. I refer to the fact that it is with their coinage all the nations carry on trade from one extremity of the earth to another. This money is regarded with admiration by all men to whether kingdom they belong, since there is no other country in which the like of it exists. Let me now return to our proper subject. For some of the old philosophers who in the course of their travels visited almost every part of the inhabited world and wrote accounts of what they learned have explained and po explained the position of the earth and the revolution of the heavenly bodies in close agreement with divine scripture let one of them now forward and give this evidence extract from the fourth book of the history of Ephorus the Indians inhabit a country in the east near sunrise while the Ethiopians dwell in the south near Meridian, the Celts in the west near sunset, and the Scythians in the north 
towards the pole. These diversions are not equal of are not of equal uh, or I'm sorry. These divisions are not of equal size. Scythia and Ethiopia being larger and India and the Celtic divisions smaller. The two larger, however, are the are of similar size and so are the two smaller for the Indians are situated between the summer and the winter sunrise while the Celts occupy the regions from the summer to the winter sunset. The two distances are equal as well as nearly opposite each other. The Scythians go again inhabit those regions which the sun leaves unvisited on the course of the revolution and they are situated opposite the Ethiopians which um, seems to extend from the winter sunrise to the shortest sunrise. Note, this Ephorus is an old writer, philosopher, and historian. That's what it looks like. Ephors, both in this text and by means of his sketch, explains accurately the divine scriptures, the position of the earth and the rev revolution of the heavenly bodies. For this, Ephorus was an historical writer who in the fourth book of the history has insisted inserted the exposition which we have cited. Pythias of Marcellus, again in his work concerning the ocean, informs us that when he had reached the remotest part of the north, the barbarous people found there showed him the cradle of the sun, for in the parts where they live the nights always have their source. Xenophanes also, the Colophian is nearly is clearly no believer in the sphere, for he supposed that the earth had no limits. Thus, then, the pagans are found in what they have said, chiming in with scared sacred scripture. But to pursue, but to pursue our argument. We again assume that the four rivers which divine scripture says emanate from paradise cleave a passage through the ocean and spring up in this earth. Of these, the Fission is the river of India, which some call Indius or Ganges. It flows down from regions in the interior and falls by many mouth, mouths into the Indian Sea. It produces beams of the Egyptian sort and the fruit called Nelagatha, savory herbs, also and lotus plants and crocodiles and everything the Nile produces. The going again which rises somewhere in Ethiopia passes through the whole of Ethiopia and Egypt and discharges its water into the Gulf by several mouths while the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates, which have their sources of the re in the regions of Persimania, flow down to the Persian Gulf. Such, then, are our opinions on these points. Divine scripture, with a view to show the diameter of paradise, how great is it, and how far extended eastward, eastward mentions the four rivers only. And thence we learn that the fountain which springs up in Eden and waters the garden distributes the residue 
of its waters among the four great rivers which cross over into the earth and water a large part of its surface. Since then, the luminaries of heaven in this manner pursue their course, making day and night, seasons and years, ser serving also for great for signs of those sailing upon the seas or traveling through deserts, while they also supply the earth with light, we shall we shall not say that they are moved by the revolution of the heavens, but rather by powers that are rational, as if they have so many torchbearers, as we shall prove once more by the declaration of divine scripture, for the divine apostle speaking of the adversary teaches what was his work from the beginning. In these words, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, words which clearly show him to have been formerly a prince endowed with the power of moving the air and changing its place, but one now cast out from ever, cast out forever from this dignity, yea, rather, one who from sheer depravity works upon sinners, as is evident from the fact that he stood not alone in having the power to do this, but shared it in common with many others. For some of the angels were commissioned to move the air, some the sun, some the rains, and rendered many others services. For this is the work of work, the appointed duty of the angelic orders and the powers to minister to the well-being and honor of the image of God, that is, of man, and to move all things like soldiers obeying the commands of the king. This work they were commanded to do on the fourth day, when God adorned the heaven with the stars, the work of the adverse demons as rebels against God is to do what, what will mar his image. For on the fourth day they transgressed the command and were cast out of heaven, as elsewhere, he says, they are not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be the heirs of salvation thus expressly declaring that they were ordained for the service of man. He further says, For the earnest expectations of the creature waveth, wait, waiteth for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was, was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it. In hope, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God, by the creature he here designates the angels, and by the sons of God, the human race, by the term earnest expectation, he represents the creature as start. St st Strain, a straining its neck to scan the distant horizon in hope of descrying, descrying some help calming, coming to man. For if the angels had not been subjected to servile ministrations, they would not have longed for liberty. For when man had sinned and received sentence of death, they were smitten with sore grief, concluding that all was hopelessly lost. For since man was the bond uniting the whole creation, as well as the image of God, they abandoned after his sentence all hope, both themselves and the universe, and were unwilling to be his servants and subordinates without resulting advantage. 
By the words, however, in the passage cited, by reason of him who hath subjected it in hope, the apostle would have us understand that God did not permit the wish of the angels to prevail, but gave them some hope that they might not despair, but be cheered with the prospect that in the course of time, good will occur to man. One second. On the sixth day, the demon who hates good, seeing man honored and thought worthy to have great care bestowed on him, became envious and formed a design to drag him down to ruin with himself. But when he was at a loss how to assail him, he happened to perceive the beast running straightway to their food, while the object of his envy looking around him at such of the trees were pleasant to the eye, remained quite unmoved, and while by the calls of appetite, whence he concluded he had received some command from God about them, having then approached nearer in the form of the serpent, he sought to learn the nature of, nature of the command, and craftily say, what hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Then the woman, who had, been, who had just been brought into the world, and was far inferior to the other in quickness of intelligence, answered his inquiry. Then, pretending he had already known the command, which he had only that moment learned, he began to accuse God of giving grudgingly and to entice man to eat of the fruit, advising him at the same time to transfer his allegiance to himself, and thus forsooth became as God, infecting him in this way with his own disease. The man was in fact persuaded in the afternoon and was that same day cast out of the garden, just as his tempter had himself as soon as he sinned been cast out of heaven. Then the man heard the sentence of death pronounced upon him, Dust thou art and dust thou shalt return. This filled the angels with sore grief, and all the more they were also disheartened at some of their own number having transgressed. Although they were more especially distressed about man, on him depended on him depended on depended what lot shall befall the whole creation. And he was also the pledge that secured the amnity of the world. For should this bond be in reality dissolved, the universe would of necessity be also dissolved. They bewailed, therefore, their own dissolution along with that of the universe that could no longer endure to minister to man without any good resulting. But when God, who is full of compassion, had through his renewed care for man and the post postponement of his punishment inspired them with good hope, they began under its influence to render their services with alacrity. Alacrity. In each generation, moreover, God, by exalting the righteous to great renown, 
still further simulated their alacrity and implanted in them hopes of renovation, of restoration, and of resurrection. At the birth particularly of the Lord Christ be according to the flesh, the whole multitude of the invisible powers having seen him born through whom the destruction of death, the beginning of the renovation of the resurrection, and their own freedom lifted up their voices in hymns of praise to God, the cause of all explaining, exclaiming, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace, good will towards men. And when and then away were thrown at last all the sorrow and degenic dejection which at one time they had suffered on account of man, and they gave expression to their joy at the birth of the second Adam. Wherefore, they also, at the time of his temptations, remembering how the days of old had witnessed the discomfiture of the first Adam, which had filled them with dismay, but seeing now the victory of the second Adam, and how fairly not once but thrice in close grip with his temper he had flung him out of the lists of the lists, they, I say, rejoiced with a great joy and were eager in bestowing their services as Scripture had recorded not now as if promoted by some hope, but because having seen with their own eyes the victory of the second Adam, they came to minister to him with joyful alacrity. But the host of, the advers of his adversaries in their turn now mourned and lamented, being confounded with shame at the victory of the second Adam. Their chief, accordingly, finding himself unable to throw him down, began to plot against him with the Jews as his instruments, and having stirred up the Jewish mob against and crucified to put him to death, imagined that he was at once and forever rid of him. But when not long afterwards the resurrection had wondrous, glorious, unexpected and mighty event and mighty event take take had taken place, and he had no longer to experience death or any other form of suffering whatever, but along with incorporate incorpor incorruption and immortality had obtained also immutability of the soul and when again he afterwards ascended heavenward in a chariot of cloud bore up like a conqueror who celebrates his triumph then did he enter without the firmament but did he, then did he enter within the firmament and was the first of all who opened up in the new and living way. The angels, therefore, clad in white raiment, rejoiced along the men, rejoiced along with men, and brought the good tidings of the disciples and the women. But their adversaries, seeing the superiority to themselves and the whole creation, of the human nature which they had at the time tipped up by the heels but by which they were now thrown down remained dumb with madness and overwhelmed the with uttermost shame wherefore the lord exclaimed to the disciples let not your hearts be troubled i have overcome the world and again lo I have given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. As much as you say, man of old, having sinned, 
where he spent where when the serpent in paradise assailed him it was said to him he shall lie in wait for the for thy heel but thou for his head that is ye shall be divided at enemy enmity against each other that man may not be under obedience to him so the warfare was then waged on equal terms each having the power to hurt the other for the serpent want watching for the heel of man that is besetting his path in order to hurt him on finding him out of the path as he could do by creeping about his heel while man being of upward stature and on his guard and not straying from his path was able to bruise the head of the serpent and now having conquered the serpent and brought him finally to shame and having through his agency unjustly endured death for those for the whole race and nailed the bond against it to the cross and blotted it out i rose again on the third day victorious over death and became the champion who has achieved victory for all the human race for the for through me the victory has been extended to all humanity be ye therefore of good courage behold i have given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and on all the power of the enemy he says in effect the serpent is no longer able to hurt your heel being himself trampled down under your feet so then just as adam had on the sixth day sinned by eating about midday of the fruit of the tree and was cast out of the garden in the afternoon so also on the sixth day and in the sixth hour the lord christ his sake endured in the flesh the cross by which we are saved and just as again from the time of the transgression to the expulsion of the garden all the angels were filled with great dismay expecting nothing else than the destruction of man and themselves and the of and of the universe so also during the passion from the sixth hour until the ninth the whole creation was shrouded in darkness in the wickedness that was being perpetuated and just as the two adam and eve were at the ninth hour cast out of paradise so also at the ninth hour the lord christ in the spirit of uh, and the thief entered into paradise on the same day on the same day therefore in which adam was made that is on the sixth there occurred both the fall of the uh, and the grief of the angels the sentence of death and the expulsion from paradise so also at the same time of the passion on the same day there occurred the death of the savior by the th by the tree of the cross the morning of the creation and in the afternoon the putting away of the mor the morning and the entrance into paradise verily i say unto you saith the saviour to the thief today shalt thou be with me in paradise glory to god for ever and ever amen but we must now return to our text wherefore the angels did not detest desist from the main ministrations which they rendered to to men liable to death and corruption for the apostle speaks for the creation was subjected to vanity not of its own will that is they were unwilling to labor and serve to no purpose but he goes on to say by reason of him who subjected it to hope in what hope because as the as is quite evident either the transgression the angels 
when they saw that God was not carrying into effect the sentence upon man, but treating him with loving care and providing him with clothing came to entertain better hopes of man so that they did not despair of him but misministered in his behalf. Then afterwards he says, and the, creation, and the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glory of the liberty of the sons of God. That is, the angels themselves shall be delivered, and with them the whole creation. When men shall be delivered from corruption and, the glorified, and be glorified, and be made immortal, and the sons of God at the world's final consummation, when the world for this world for this world shall pass away, and the resurrection of the dead shall take place, and the existing order of which shall be charged, for when it shall come to pass in accordance with divine scripture that the stars shall fall, and the course of the night and the cor and, and day cease. And the angels who move them be liberated through the exemption of men for, cor from corruption, who shall thus not at all need, who shall thus not at all need them, that need them. What then can these new lawgivers say who think that the heavens is spherical? and assert that the stars are moved and yet move of themselves. For what useful purpose let them tell us if at, the, at least they define themselves to be Christians? Will the heaven then perform revolutions but away with these incept? These un these unstable men for the apostle yet again exclaims that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now thereby giving showing that the whole creation especially the angels themselves are burdened in the state of existence from being subservient to corruption and mutation for since they are themselves mutable they are constantly absorbed in reflections about mutation, thinking over and hoping for liberty and longing to obtain it, the, and obtain it they shall. As has been stated, when men rise from the dead, for unless they had themselves received a law prescribing what they should do, and should not do, they could not have fallen into sin, for some of them could not have transgressed as they did unless they had received this law from God. Those consequently who transgressed were cast down on high to the earth, for I saw it in the Lord who speaks, Satan like lightning from heaven, but without law it is impossible for there should be transgression, as saith the Apostle. For where there is no law, there is no transgression, and without the law, sin is dead. So that the angels themselves in every way want to obtain freedom from the law and from the mutation. Now this is now of this liberty the cause has been set has been and will be the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ for all things the apostle saith both those which are in heaven and those which are in the earth are summed up in Christ and if any one is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. On the first day, 
that is the Lord's day, the foundation of the world and the beginning of the creation took place, God having begun in the evening to create those things which compromise the whole world, comprise the whole world, that is to say, heaven and earth, creating along with them a darkness and the water and the air and the fire which has been commingled with the earth and commingled with the earth and the angels producing all these at one time therefore on the same day and the same night a new creation of the whole world again took place for the whole world has its circumscription in man because man ha has as has been frequently stated is the bond which holds all the world together then when man therefore rose again on the same night of the lord's day incorruptible and immortal and unchangeable he gave a pledge to the whole creation visible and invisible that it would obtain like benefits therefore the apostle saith to sum up all things in the christ both the things that are in heaven and the things and that are in the earth and if anyone be in christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things behold all things because man is contemplated things visible and to sum up all things in Christ both the things that are in heaven and that are in earth and if any one be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things have become new and he says all things because in men Behold, all things become new. He says all things because, and they are kind of blah, 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 blah. Okay, sorry about that, guys. To the Lord Christ, the possession of the perfect manhood is described, is deceived by failing to understand the great dispensation which God has planned, as well as to conceive or write the Christian doctrine in like manner. Again, he who denies his perfect Godhead is chargeable with guilt and is utterly misled. Since then, this hope is placed before Christians that the angels and the whole creation shall be renovated into a better and blessed and a blessed state of existence, who is so malignant, malignant, and so impious as to abandon his hope, this hope, and lean for support on the new beguiling folly of the pagans. For he shall hear in the day from the judge these words, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity. For it is in the sooth a great iniquity to reject the declarations of God and in opposition to them to ascribe a spherical form to the heaven for such men are incapable of receiving the blessed hope and manifestation of the glory of the great God our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us nor did they wish along with the faithful to hear the Lord Jesus Christ exclaiming from high from on high 
Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you and from the foundation of the world. But always inferring, erring in the opinions they are world round in ceaseless revolution along with their sphere without any hope that there will ever be a pause. Since the heavenly bodies then, according to divine scripture, are moved in their orbits by invisible powers and run their course through the north, pass below the elevated part of the earth, it is possible with such a configuration for eclipses of the moon and of the sun to be produced produced for the angelic powers by moving the figures on rational principles in regular order with greater speed than lies in us to apprehend produce these phenomena plying their labors by night and by day without ever pausing for as on the one hand the pagans assert that underneath the earth these bodies revolve far out of sight thus was thus as was before shown advancing views not not only uh, out of harmony with the nature of things but opposed to the divine testimony so we on our other hand following divine scripture conceive that the revolution of the course of the heavenly bodies have some slight obliquity and affirming that they are accomplished in this manner for this being so eclipses of necessity follow and we are thus opposed neither to the deity nor to the nature of things for god must be believed in preference in preference to all the notions and all the teachings of men and with reference again to the four clements we say that god having first established the earth as being dry made it the foundation of the universe because of its heaviness water again which is the most the which is the moist element he set above the earth on account of its fluidity and the two and the two as the being opposite in their qualities he thought good to place together on account of their good temperature next he placed above these the air which is the coldest cold element and above the air again fire which is the warm element because these are both lighter than the other elements there are however mutually opposed and therefore the two elements which are placed together in the middle water which is moist and air which is cold having many mutual aff affinities the the one only being of fluid and the other of porous nature while both are soft to the touch and readily receiving into themselves the qualities of each other and of their op opposites impart them in return each other and blend the whole together which these two elements i say he thought good to place in the middle between the other two the dry and warm that all nature might not be destroyed and reduced to a cinder from for from the readiness with which these two middle elements pervade each thing each each other the pagans have fallen into error and turning things the opposite way call air moist and water cold consequent upon this they bestow two qualities upon the sing upon a single element and frequently even four 
God again provided rains for the good of the earth through the angelic powers who with the utmost ex exertion, exertion bring them up from the sea into the clouds and in obedience to the divine command discharge them wherever the divine command directs. For saith scripture by the prophet Amos, he that calleth the forth the water of the sea and poureth it over the face of the earth. Amos 9 6, also see Zechariah 10 1, 1 Kings 18 41. With regard to earthquakes, we affirm that they are not produced by wind, for we do not. For we do not, like our opponents, have resource, resource to fables, but simply say that they occur by divine appointment. For saith scripture through David, he looketh upon the earth and maketh it tremble. Amos, uh, with regard again to the antipodes, divine scripture does not suffer me neither to me either to say or hear anything about these fables for he made the apostle of the one of the whole race of men to dwell upon the whole face of the earth he does not mean upon every face of the earth but upon its face the dead again are buried in the earth he calls the subterraneans as in the passage that in the names of Jesus every knee shall bow, of being celestial and terrestrial and subterranean, where by being celestial are meant the angels by the terrestrial mean, and by the subterranean those that are buried in the earth. For the apostle says that this is to take place at the resurrection when all alike angels that are in heaven men that are upon the earth and the dead that are buried in the earth shall all rise to bow the knee in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. For we are said to tread upon the earth in the sense of expression as used in the passage. I have given you power to tread upon the serpents and scorpions. To tread, therefore, implies trending above someone but if we tread above any one who treads in the opposite direction, we must, we must below him who treads above him. But according to those wiseacres, a spherical body has neither an above nor a below, and hence we neither tread nor are trodden on in return nor do we at all walk on the earth consequently all their theories are but inventions and fables which regard again to angels and demons and souls divine scripture represents them as completely circumscribed and as living in this world as when the apostle says we are made a spectacle unto the world and to the angels and to men as if they all lived in one and the same world. In Daniel also it kept, it speaks thus on the same point. And the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me on the twenty, on, withstood me on the twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I left him there with the king of, Pers of the Persians. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. The expression, he withstood me, and the other, he came and went away, and I left the him there. And others, like import, refer to beings whose natures are circumscribed. It is moreover to be observed that archangels are entrusted with the administration and guardianship of particular nations and kingdoms. 
Yea, even that an angel attends each man as a high guardian, as when the church says concerning Peter in Acts, it is his angel. The Lord likewise in the Gospels exclaim, For their angels always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven, thus plainly showing that each one of us has his angel, evidently as his guide, and his guardian for deity alone is circumscribed existing everywhere and as the same and in the same manner for if i ascend saith david into the heavens thou art there if i descend into hades thou art present there if i should take to myself wings at morning that is in the east and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea that is in the west, even there shall thy hand lead me, evidently indicating here the uncircumscribed nature of the deity. But this cannot be supposed to hold good of the angels, who in the passage above cited are said to have been left in the certain in a certain place. With respect to souls, divine scripture declares that to be circumscribed and indicates them to be circumscribed by the body itself, as in the passage, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Thus speaking of the soul as being within and again, my heart and my flesh. There, Here it uses the heart instead of soul, as if the soul had its seat its seat in the heart and the and was within the body as when it says again in my heart have i hid thy words and i might not sin against thee that is i have hid them in my soul and again create in me a clean heart o god meaning a clean soul the lord too speaks thus not that which goeth into a man defileth him, for it goes into the belly and is cast out into the drought. But the things which proceed out of the heart, that is the soul which th these defile the man, which as evil thoughts and other things peculiar to the soul which enumerate. Uh, elsewhere, again, he says that is... What is more adapted to put the Jews to shame, the kingdom of God is within you, instead of saying ye ought always to have the kingdom of God within the soul. And again, to the thief who believed in him, he gave this promise, Verily I say unto you today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. He is evidently as possible here as evidently as possible he speaks of the soul as a place as in place in a place and that he speaks with reference to the soul that not the body to the soul and not the body is evident from the fact that the body of the Lord was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in Jerusalem and from the thief was buried there also. Most manifestly, there he speaks of the soul when saying, Today shalt thou, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Besides, most of the evangelists, when speaking of the death of the Lord, say he gave up the spirit that is the spirit within, namely the soul, which went out of the body. Another of the evangelists says, having borrowed his head, he gave up the spirit. We have advanced the foregoing conclusions as expressive of the true Christian theory, having been moved to accept them by divine scripture, for they are not inventions of conjectures or of our own, but we have strictly followed what God has spoken to us through the prophets and the apostles and his own son now as all those undertake to deal with such topics independent 
in dependence on their own reasonings and conjectures fall into endless perplexities and errors and can say nothing with certainty it behooves every true Christian to take refuge in God the maker of all who knows the how and the why for everything in order that we may not wonder but be blown away by it I wonder but be blown about by every wind of doctrine of men according to what the apostle says in craftiness of speech and after the wiles of error and thus even ourselves be condemned along with the world Moses also in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers gives expression to the same thoughts and the Lord said unto Moses speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fingers in the borders of their garments their throughout their generations and that they put upon fringe upon the fringe of each border a cord of blue and it shall unto you be a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that ye go not about after your own follies and after your own eyes which ye used to go a whoring that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God I am the Lord your God for God himself in the passage teaches more clearly that the Apostle also has taught us that we should not follow our own imaginations but rather the divine precepts God grant O honored head that we may abstain from these things and cling instead to those that are divine through the prayers of your holiness O most Christian father so that we may find mercy and grace before the throne of forevermore amen